I think that did it. Okay, uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so welcome everybody to the, the graduate student seminar series. Um, just wanna say a couple of uh, quick notes at the beginning here. Uh, so despite graduate students sort of being in the title of the seminar, uh, the attendance is open to anybody and people's backgrounds can vary a lot. So um, just please be uh, respectful to your friends and colleagues. Um, and please also uh, do ask questions during the seminar. I think uh, the primary goal is for this to be sort of a positive learning experience for everyone here. Um, in the spirit of a sort of a usual in-person seminar, uh, if you have any questions uh, or like uh, clarifications or anything like that, uh, it's perhaps easiest just to go ahead and unmute yourself and, and politely ask out loud. Uh, you can also just go ahead and type it in chat. I'll keep an eye on it. Um, and I'll try to relay any questions to the speaker that come up. Um, if you have a question that might involve like a long, a longer or more involved answer, we'll also leave a little bit of time at the end uh, if you'd like to ask them. Uh, all right, so with that being said, uh, so it's my great, great pleasure to introduce uh, Kimberly Ayers, who's at Cal State San Marcos, and she'll be telling us about uh, st stochastic logistic maps and invariant distributions. Okay, great. Thanks, Zach. Um, I think we're sort of small crowd today. So like Zach said, if you have any questions, like feel free to just interrupt me. Um, I have a hard time when I'm screen sharing seeing the chat. So I guess, Zach, if you don't mind monitoring the chat and then letting me know if there are any questions there. Um, hopefully things should be mostly, for the most part, there, there's a little bit of like jargon and stuff that I, that I don't want you to worry too much about. Hopefully if you've had some analysis background, I'm hoping this talk should be mostly accessible, but, but like I said, please feel free to interrupt with any questions at any time. Um, okay, so why don't you want to change slides? There we go. Um, I just, I've started um, including land acknowledgements in the talks that I've been giving recently. Um, so I just want to, I want to open up with a quick one. Um, right now, I'm currently based in Helena, Montana. Um, Helena, Montana sits on the native land of the Knights, I looked this up, the pronunciation earlier, Knights of Tapis uh, Stockaway, or also known as the Blackfeet people. Um, but I will be starting a new position at Cal State San Marcos in the fall, and so that's sort of my current affiliation. Um, that university sits on the land of the Luceno and the Kumie people. And I know that this is the graduate seminar for, uh, for University of Georgia in Athens. So I looked up Athens, Georgia, sits on the native land of the Cherokee, the Yuchi, and the Muscogee peoples. Um, and if you are curious about where you are, or what whose native land that you are sitting on, um, there's a website, there's a, there's a land map, um, and you can find that at nativeland.ca. Okay, so to start us off, um, so what I'm talking about today are what are called discrete dynamical systems. So a discrete dynamical system is a pair fx, where f is a function um, whose domain and range are the same, so some space x. Typically, at least in my case, I consider um, functions that have a compact uh, domain and range. So, so for the most, most talk, you can think, think of these, these spaces as being compact spaces. Um, compactness is nice because it gets you, you know, limits and convergence and, and you know that things can't run off to infinity anywhere, basically, which is kind of nice. So um, since F has the same domain and range, what I can do is I can take compositions of F with itself, right? I can look at, I can look at successive iterations of F of F of F of F of however many times. Um, so dynamicists like myself are then interested in looking at what are called orbits. These are sequences where if I have an initial starting value somewhere in that domain X, um, the orbit of that point is basically what happens if I just hit that point with f over and over again. So I'll look at f of x naught, and then I'll look at f of f of x naught, and then f of f of f of x naught, and so on and so forth. So I'm creating these sequences. So once I have sequences, um, and there's going to be a, maybe two instances of, of um, audience participation here. If I have a sequence, what are questions, like if I have sequences, what are some questions I'm interested in if I hand you a sequence? What are things that you would like to ask about sequences? Convergence. Yeah, right. Like, do do sequences converge? Right. Do I have convergence of these sequences? Um, other question. Any other, any other things that we ask about sequences? Is not convergence boundedness? So uh, boundedness. Sure, we can ask about boundedness. Since I am considering compact spaces, um, I do. Um, we do have boundedness sort of built in already since we're looking at or sequences of compact, of compact spaces. Um, 
But like Bolzano Weierstrass also gives us that bounded sequences have to have convergent subsequences, right? Yes. So like what types of convergent subsequences do I have if my sequence itself is not convergent? Or like, do these sequences ever, um, ever repeat themselves, right? Do I ever get into this point where I get like this periodic, where I see things repeating themselves over and over again? And then what happens if a sequence does neither of those things, right? If it's neither convergent nor like periodic, what does that mean about that sequence? What, what does that tell me about the behavior of this system? Okay, so as a real quick example, um, so I'm gonna look at what's called the doubling map. So this is a function that maps numbers from the unit interval zero, one to itself. So basically all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a number between zero and one, multiply it by two. If what I get is bigger than one, ju then just take it mod one, right? So just subtract one off. So for instance, like 0.75 times two is 1.5, 1.5 is bigger than one. So I subtract one off and I get that 0.75 maps to 0.5. Um, so here, the blue, the dark blue, they're both blue. The dark blue is the, the graph of the doubling map there. The light blue is my identity function, y equals x. And I can use this to build what are called cobweb maps to look at what orbits kind of, I can, this allows me to sort of visualize orbits. So let's do a quick example together. Um, so let's say I start with a starting value of 0.41. That's like, you can see the little red dot down there is 0.41. So where's 0.41 gonna map to? under the doubling map. Point eight two. Yeah, 0. 0.82, right? So, okay, we know how functions work. I look up where the Y value is, 0. 0.82. And now I'm interested, okay, so now my 0. 0.82 is now gonna be my new input, right? So what happens to 0. 0.82 under the doubling map? 0. 0.64. 0. 0.64, right, 0. 0.82 times two is 1.64, subtract off that one, right? So what I can do is I can, trans, I can translate horizontally over to that y equals x line. This is where my x and my y are both 0.82, right? And now I can look down vertically at where I am and I get 0.64, right? Go on over horizontally to the y equals x line, 0.64 is gonna map to 0.28. Translate over horizontally, 0.28 will map to 0.56. 0.56 will map to 0 0.12, 0.12 maps to 0 0.24, 0 0.48, 0 0.96. You guys get the picture here, right? So I'm looking at successive iterates um, from that one starting value. And eventually, if I were to sort of do this many, many times, um, I'd get a picture that starts to look like this. So hopefully it's now a little bit self-explanatory why we call these things um, cobweb maps, right? It kind of looks like a spider has stitched up a little cobweb in between there. Okay, so there's the sequence that I started building. Um, obviously, this is only the first handful of terms. We could have done this infinitely or arbitrarily many times. Um, what do you all think? Is this sequence ever going to repeat eventually? It should. Why is that? Well, I mean, your answer is always going to be two decimal points. So at some point, you're going to have to go back to something you landed on before. Yeah, exactly. I only like, I'm never gonna get, see more than two decimal places through this process, right? I can't multiply something with two decimal places by two and get something that I can extend out to three decimal places, right? So there's only finitely many um, things that I can, uh, that, I, that is possible for me to sort of reach from this, right? There's only, um, 100 or really 50 rather, because after 0 0.41, these all have to end in an even number, right? So pigeonhole principle, right, says that like once I've gone more than 100 or so times, eventually I have to hit something I've seen before. And once I hit something I've seen before, I know exactly what's gonna happen after that because then, then it's just gonna follow that same pattern over and over and over again, right? Okay, so this is a really basic example of a discrete dynamical system. Um, in general, as a dynamicist, what, what I'm interested in is like classifying systems, right? What sort of what sorts of systems are similar to each other? Um, what sort of systems are qualitatively different? Um, I want to be able to understand a system completely, by which I mean like I want to say exactly like what is going to happen to 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 points within side within zero one, right? I want to be able to like make a complete statement about about those orbits. 
Um, and I want to be able to quantify that behavior in some way. Does it seem quote unquote random or like predictable or patterned in any way? Okay, so, but today the focus of my talk is, talk is on a very specific or very special um, dynamical, discrete dynamical system, which is known as the logistic map. So the logistic map, again, I'm taking the unit interval zero one to itself, and it's given by this function uh, lambda x times one, one minus x, where lambda is gonna be some value in between one and four. So lambda is just a fixed parameter. You can pick what you like, um, you know, but as long as it's a value in between one and four. Um, you can let lambda be less than one. Um, that's, that's not a terribly interesting system because everything eventually just converges to zero in that case. Um, if you let lambda be greater than four, does anyone have any ideas why it would be a problem if I let lambda be greater than four? And I'll give you a hint. This picture here is with lambda at 3.9. What do you kind of notice about the, the range of that function? Um, oh, if lambda is greater than four, then the uh, the range, or there would be values of x not within the range. Right, exactly. If lambda is bigger than four, my parabola here is going to go above y equals one. So I'm mapping the unit interval zero one to numbers outside the unit interval zero one, which would be a problem. Um, so that's why I'm taking lambda to be a maximum value of four. Um, you can consider um, you can consider uh, uh, situations with lambda greater than four. You basically just have to remove the the sort of the interval that gets mapped to something bigger than one each time. And by removing subintervals, what you end up doing is you actually construct um, what we call an invariant cantor set. Right, the cantor set is taken by removing little subintervals each time. So you end up having dynamics not on the whole interval zero one, but on like a cantor set type of thing, um, which which is is cool in and of itself, but not the focus of what I'm doing today. Okay, so when lambda takes values in between um, in between zero and one, or not zero and one, uh, one and four, this map is always going to have two fixed points. So by fixed points, what I mean is a function that like that or a, a value of x such that x equals f of x. So once I hit it with f, I get back the same point. And I can see visually where those things are by looking at where my function, so my green is my logistic map there, where this guy intersects the identity map. So you can see this is always gonna happen at zero and I'm also gonna get an intersection here at one minus one over lambda. Um, that's gonna be another fixed point there. So I always have those two fixed points. Okay, if I take values of lambda between one and three, um, including one, but not including three, if I, no matter what value I start with, um, my cobweb map, my sequence is always gonna end up converging to that non-zero fixed point. So if I look at the sequence of that orbit, I'm gonna get a sequence that converges to whatever one minus one over lambda is. In this. So in this particular case, um, I've picked lambda of 1.95, um, and I'll see that for this particular starting value, my cobweb, uh, my, my sequence converges to that non-zero fixed point. And that's gonna happen no matter what starting point you pick between zero and one. Um, at three, something interesting happens. Um, instead of converging to the fixed point, we actually end up bouncing around the fixed point in a, what we call an attracting period two orbit. So it's sort of small, but you can hopefully see that this cobweb diagram is sort of converging to this, it's probably not quite a square, um, um, that sort of contains that fixed point. So I don't get arbitrarily close to that fixed point, but rather I get arbitrarily close to this sort of this period two orbit. So this is with lambda equal to three. And again, that same starting value as before of 0.86. Um, and one of the reasons the logistic map is so famous is because it's an example of what we call um, a chaotic system. 
So if I keep increasing, so here this is with lambda equal to three. If I keep bumping up that parameter value there, looking at like 3.1, 3.2, 3.3, um, I start seeing new attracting orbits show up. So eventually I'm gonna see um, an attracting or period four orbit. And I'm gonna see an attracting period eight orbit. And I'm gonna see an attracting period 16 orbit as I keep increasing that value of lambda there. So that's what we call um, a period doubling cascade. Uh, because again, I'm seeing, I'm seeing the, the, the period of those period of those uh, uh, attracting period orbits are doubling each time. Um, so this image here is what we call a bifurcation diagram. And it basically shows you kind of what the stability of my system is going to be. So here you see, this is my attracting fixed point here. Right, so this is one minus one over lambda. Ignore the fact that that's an R down there. Um, think of R as lambda. Um, and I can see, you know, so I see I have one attracting fixed point up until I get to my lambda value of three, and then I see a split, right? Because that split represents, oh, now my limit behavior is approaching a period two orbit, right? So now I see two branches here, and that represents that period two orbit that shows up. And then at R being somewhere between 3.4 and 3.5, um, we get a split again, right? So now I'm gonna see an attracting period four orbit. And then you can see it's obviously gonna have to happen more and more and more quickly, um, but I'll see eventually like a period, um, a period eight orbit, a period 16 orbit. Again, that's that period doubling cascade that I talked about. Um, and so for almost all Lambda values bigger than this 3.56 number, um, we see what is called chaotic behavior. Now, I haven't told you what chaotic behavior is yet, and I will in a minute, but I do want to point out something very special here. Um, you might notice slightly bigger than 3.8, there's this sort of like white band. Um, can anyone tell what the period of the attracting periodic orbit is looking at that? It's, I realize it's small. Is there, can I zoom in? There we go. Can anyone tell? Is it, is it a three? It's three, yeah. And um, for reasons I won't get into today, three is actually a really, really special number um, in, in these one dimensional dynamics. Period three orbits are like really rare um, and they're really special. Um, and so it's so cool that this logistic map shows, demonstrates that period three orbit, that attractive period three orbit, because those are, that's like basically the rarest period that you can see. Um, so again, that's a little bit beyond the scope of this talk. Um, if you're interested more, you know, you can ask me about it later. Um, but I just wanted to point that out because that is, that is very, very cool. Okay, so what do I mean by chaotic behavior? Um, so rather than my orbits being attracted to either fixed points or to periodic orbits, instead, what I'm going to see for the most part, basically for almost any starting value that I can pick between zero and one, the orbit actually just kind of fills up that entire interval between zero and one. So the orbit tur turns into a, it, the sequence is actually going to be a dense set inside zero and one. So I see, this, I see this orbit kind of filling up the entire space and it doesn't converge to like one fixed point or to one periodic orbit, but rather just kind of goes all over the place and fills up the entire space. Um, chaos has, I'm sort of like engaging in a little bit of discourse about this on Twitter, but like chaos is a little bit, um, the, the notion of chaos mathematically is a little bit chaotic because pun completely intended because um, there's like many, many, many different definitions of chaos and depending on who you ask, um, you might get different definitions. So there are like, there are other definitions of chaos that people use out there, but like this dense orbit thing is, kind of, we call this topological transitivity, um, is kind of one of the hallmark things that you'll see showing up in most of those definitions. Okay, so, before I was talking about what I call the deterministic logistic map. So that's where 
lambda takes a fixed value in between one and four and it doesn't change, right? With each of my iterates, lambda is always gonna be 3.87 or, or whatever value of lambda I'm, I'm looking at. So now I want to introduce what's called the stochastic logistic map. So instead of being, instead of looking at the logistic map with a fixed constant value of lambda, what if with each successive iteration, lambda took on a new, uh, a new value each time according to some kind of a distribution? Um, and according to some kind of a probability distribution. Here I say, and I should, I should probably change that. I say according to a, distri a uniform distribution on a subinterval of one to four, um, but there's no reason necessarily that that would have to be uniform. You just want some probability distribution of lambda um, on some interval, um, subinterval of one to four. And ideally, I guess I can't think of, ideally for the properties that I've been studying, ideally you would want that PDF, that probability density function to be absolutely continuous. Um, so, so I'm not looking at like, you know, delta distributions um, for the most part, um, just because that makes a lot of the math that we end up doing later on a lot more nice. Um, but so this is a cobweb diagram that I made um, where Lambda is taking on random values between I think according to a uniform distribution on one to four. So what you see here is the blue parabola is the logistic map when lambda is equal to one. And I'm questioning that whether that's the case actually, I feel like that's not the case. Um, but the red here is with lambda equal to, and I guess that's not quite, that, that would be probably two, right? So, so I'm taking, I'm taking, um, I'm taking different values of lambda with each iteration, right? So I no longer can have convergence to like a fixed point or a periodic orbit because those things don't make sense as they, as they don't exist deterministically, right? Like I, I can't have a single fixed point anymore because that fixed point changed values with each lambda and now my lambda is changing values each time. So I no longer have like a single fixed point anymore, right? So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider, instead of looking at initial starting values of x between 0 and 1, I'm going to consider an initial starting probability density. So if I have a probability distribution for my initial value of x naught, you know, taking values between 0 and 1, what's the probability distribution of my next iterate, x of 1, once I've hit it with this, with this stochastic logistic map that one time and, for, and, and further iterates? So now, instead of looking at orbits that consist of, of single points in between zero and one, my sequence that I'm building, the like entries of my sequence are now probability density functions that are supported on z the interval zero, one. So now, instead of finding like periodic orbits or, or fixed points, I'm interested in finding like invariant distributions. So if I have a distribution of X, you know, between zero and one, what distributions remain unchanged when I hit it with the stochastic logistic map one time? And also like, what about the stability of these invariant distributions, right? Do other distributions kind of converge towards this one invariant distribution that I'm seeing? Okay, so a little bit of notation here. Um, and this is basically, I don't want you to worry too much if, if some of this um, kind of goes beyond uh, your understanding. It's, it's basically just the rigorous framework for how we study these things. Um, so just a little bit of notation here. So here I'm gonna consider K to be a subinterval of the interval one four. Um, since I'm studying topological properties of these things, it'd be nice, I need like measures and stuff. So I'm looking at the Borel sigma algebra of subsets of K. So those are, um, that's the sigma algebra that's generated by open and closed intervals, right? I'm gonna have some kind of a probability measure on that, on, the, on my Borel subsets. Um, and now my logistic map here is taking, it's, 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 it's a, um, it's a function on a product space, right? Because I have two inputs now. I have what value is my parameter lambda taking and then what value like of X between zero and one am I looking at? So this is now a map from K cross zero one into zero one. Um, and you can denote it either of these ways, but the point is that I now have to consider 
two inputs in a way, right? My lambda value and my x value. Okay, um, so some more notations. So sigma here, basically what I'm gonna do is I'm sort of gonna look at the sequence of possible, um, of possible lambda values, right? So I'm gonna sort of consider the universe of all the different like sequences that, that lambdas could take with each of my iterations, right? So like, what are all the possible values lambda could take for the first? What are all the possible values that lambda could take the second time around and then the third and the fourth? And I'm looking at those possible sequences there. Um, and again, I need some sort of a topological understanding. Now I have a space made up of sequences. So I need to like be able to look at things like measures on that thing. So what we're going to do is I'm going to look at the sigma algebra that's generated by products of my Borel sets on K, except only finitely many of the things in this, in this product here are proper subsets of K. The others are all like the whole set K itself. Um, and we call those things cylinder sets. So what I'm doing is I'm building a random dynamical system. So like I said, I now have a measurable product space, right? I have two, um, I have sigma algebras on, on this product. Um, and I'm gonna look at what's called a skew product map. So this here is the formal definition of skew product map. Um, it looks really intimidating when you first think about it, but basically all I'm doing is I'm considering, I have two different spaces now, right? I have the sequence of X values that I'm looking at and I have the sequence of Lambda values. And my Lambdas don't pay attention to what's happening to X, right? The Lambdas just get generated each time, you know, according to whatever distribution I'm using. Um, like I said, probably some kind of a interval of k or a sub interval of zero one not zero one one four um so those get you know every time we generate a new lambda value and that's totally independent of what's happening in my unit interval zero one with my x values right however my x values each subsequent x value needs to look at what's happening in the lambdas get information from the lambdas before it can tell you what the next value of x is going to be so basically all this is saying is i have sort of two things running concurrently one of which is dependent on the other one, but the, that other one is, is happening sort of independent of anything else. Um, and this just gives me this here, I'm just talking about what we need to kind of formalize again, the dynamics on what the lambdas are. So I have a sequence of my lambda values. Basically, this is the list of, of the different values that lambda is going to take as I keep iterating this thing. Um, and now I just take what's called the shift map. Um, Basically, I just lop off the first the first entry there, and I still have a new I have a new infinite sequence. Um, we call it the shift map because you can sort of think of it taking the whole sequence and shifting it one entry to the right, and then that first entry just kind of falls off the end. Um, so, so either way you want to think about it, either just like by not to be morbid, sort of beheading the sequence and getting rid of that first entry, or by shifting the whole thing to the to the right and then having that first entry fall off. Okay, so like I said, we have the skew product map now, right? I have these two things running at the same time. I have my values in zero one, I have my sequences of lambdas, and now these are running together where these things in zero ones need to look at what's happening to the lambdas each time. So that's why this first entry here, you see there's that dependence on lambda happening. Whereas in the second coordinate here, there's no dependence on the X values at all. This thing just happens completely on its own. So this thing now is what we call, is a, is a Markov process, is, which is a type of stochastic process. Um, so like I said, we are interested in probability density functions now, right? I'm interested in taking some, some probability density function, hitting it with my stochastic logistic map and seeing what the, new, what the new distribution looks like after one iterate, after two iterates, after three iterates. Um, so just again, quick notation here. Um, this is basically, I can look at like, if I have a starting value of X and I have some Borel subset of my unit interval zero one, we can ask questions like, what's the, what's the probability that if I hit X with the stochastic logistic map, that my next iterate is gonna be inside that particular set that I'm looking at, right? So for instance, if X takes value, my starting X value is like 0.8, 
And the interval G that I'm interested in is, I don't know, the open interval from zero to 0.1, right? I can ask like, what's the probability that when I hit 0.8 with the stochastic logistic map, that the next iterate is somewhere between zero and 0.1. Okay, so I, I give this definition because I, I want to motivate um, this a new definition of this thing called Harris irreducibility. So Harris irreducibility, again, you can read the formal rigorous definition for yourself if you'd like, but the way that I really think about Harris irreducibility is that basically no matter where, so we, we, call, we, call, a, um, we call this process Harris irreducible if no matter where your starting value is, anywhere between zero and one, if you consider a set of prob positive measure, um, a subset of, of zero, one of positive measure, um, and I guess I should say probably a Borel set, um, that eventually I have a positive probability of getting into that set of positive measure at some point, right? So even if I start, way over close to zero, right? So let's say that I start with 0 0.001. Eventually that orbit has a positive probability of being mapped into, I don't know, the interval from 0.9 to 0.91 or something, right? Because that interval has positive measure. And so if my, if my system is Harris irreducible, I know that eventually I have to get mapped into that with positive probability at some point. So basically everything is sort of getting like all mixed up here, right? I can start way over the right and I know that eventually things have to move over to the left. I can start way over the left and things eventually have to move way over to the right. So, I mean, Harris irreducibility is cool in and of its own. It kind of feels a little bit like, at least to me, um, it feels a little bit like the stochastic version of chaos, right? Remember chaos is when we saw this dense orbit, these orbits that sort of fill up the entire space. Um, here again, I have, I have stochasticity in play, so I can't talk about like really dense orbits per se, but I can talk about this kind of like mixing quality, right? Where, where everything sort of gets mixed up everywhere else. It gets really like blended together, like a nice smoothie or something. Um, so, I mean, Harris irreducibility is cool in and of itself, but, um, we actually care about it for another reason. Um, and the reason is because of this theorem, which basically says that if a Markov process is Harris irreducible and has some invariant, uh, invariant probability or invariant measure, and I say invariant under the Perron Frobenius operator, I highlighted that because I haven't defined what that is yet. Um, so if I have Harris irreducibility and I have an invariant probability, then that invariant probability is the only one. It's unique. It's like the unique fixed point of this system. And furthermore, um, I, I see that other probability measures converge to that invariant distribution. So that's what this, and I should say this norm here, um, it really actually doesn't really matter. Um, I think we've been taking like the soup norm for the most part. Um, but basically like no matter what you sort of, no matter how you define this norm in, in a way that is sort of makes sense, um, you see convergence to that unique probability measure. So no, no matter what starting distribution of X values you take, eventually, um, eventually you get this thing sort of converges to this one unique probability measure. So that's what I mean when I said earlier on, I was like, I wanna be able to understand the system completely. This is what I mean. This is, I wanna be able to say no matter what, no matter what starting distribution you give me, I know eventually this thing is going to, I know eventually this thing is going to converge to this invariant distribution here. And that distribution allows me, tells me like, you know, it tells me information about like the underlying dynamics, right? If this thing is sort of spread out all over the place, or if I see like pockets appearing, um, um, it tells me information about the dynamics there. Okay, so I mentioned I was going to define the Perron Frobenius operator. Again, I don't want you to get too hung up with the prone for BDS operator. This is the formal definition of it, but basically it's just an operator on my probability distributions, right? If I have a starting distribution and I hit it with my stochastic logistic map, what does the distribution of X values look like in the next iterate? So that's the formal definition there. Um, uh, okay, so 
we have numerically my 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 um my collaborator and i have numerically figured out that this thing is gonna converge to some kind of um of invariant density um we can see that it's happening numerically because my first iteration is like let's say i start with a uniform distribution right so my x values are uniformly taking values between zero and one um, my first iteration there's a light green guy here and then I have other ones, the third iteration, the ninth iteration, 12th iteration. Eventually I get convergence to, we call this like a shark fin map because it kind of looks like a shark fin. Um, so numerically we can see that there is some kind of invariant distribution that appears to be stable or asymptotically stable that appears that other, um, other distributions kind of converge to this thing. Um, we're still working out the details of proving this, so we still haven't proven, we kind of have like the bits and pieces of proving this and proving that the stochastic logistic map is Harris irreducible, and therefore we have the, you know, the uniqueness of this invariant distribution and the stability of it as well, um, but that's still a work in progress. Um, the next question is like, what is actually um, the value of this invariant, what is the, what is the actual function of this invariant distribution here? Um, and this, I have to credit uh, my collaborator, Amy Radinskaya with, because I have no idea where she pulled this out from. But um, our numeric, so the red here is what are from under simulation, what we found the invariant density to be. Um, the blue here is kind of her, her guessed invariant density given by this function here. Again, I know she did some kind of a von Neumann analysis to get this. That's, I, I frankly don't really understand that at all. So I just have to give her full credit for that. Um, but we sort of, this is like her kind of best guess at what that, in, that function actually is. Um, and it's possible it doesn't have any like really nice closed form thing, but, but we're trying it, we're, we're trying. Um, and that's kind of as close as she's gotten there. Um, so some more open problems, and these are things that my collaborators and I are, are currently working on. So like what happens, we can talk about things like the expected value, right? What happens to the expected value of the iterates when noise is added? So for some other, you know, expected value, I mean, it still makes sense in this sort of deterministic way, but for some other maps, we've seen that when you add the noise or like the stochasticity of this thing that the expected value actually changes, that the expected value becomes lower or bigger um, than the, in the deterministic case. Um, and also how can I stabilize distributions that sort of correspond to underlying periodic orbits? So you can see for instance, like the shark fin is mostly supported on that entire interval zero one. We would really love, for instance, to see a, a distribution that kind of has, that's supported, for instance, on, on like little sub intervals, right? So let's say, for instance, I had a distribution that was supported on three little sub intervals of zero, one. And what that would tell me is like, I'm sort of, it's like kind of like I'm converging to a period three orbit, right? Because I'm seeing instead of my X values in the limit being able to take values anywhere between zero and one, they have to take values in these sort of three little neighborhoods. And if they sort of rotate between those guys, that's kind of like, we call them quasi periodic orbits. Um, so are there ways for me to find those periodic, those periodic orbits or quasi periodic orbits? So those are some problems, some, uh, some projects that we're, we've been working on. Um, so thank you. Let's go ahead and uh, thank Kimberly for a wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kimberly. Feel free to unmute and clap, or you can use the there's like the clap emoji in the, the chat somewhere. Uh, does anybody have any questions? So one one thing I was I was kind of wondering is how. Um, there was this plot a while back where you had you started with the uniform distribution, you got them converging to sort of the, yeah. the shark fin thing. Yeah. How do you how do you generate all of those intermediate distributions? Um, I mean, these are these are they're not really density functions. These are really generated from histograms. Um, 
right? So I'm looking at like things, sampling things from a uniform distribution and then looking at the histogram of what's happening like to their orbits, right? So keeping track each time if I, if I hit it with the stochastic logistic map. Um, so, so yeah, these are not, these are not, these are really, really coming from like a numeric simulation here. This is not, um, this is not unfortunately coming from, um, I guess you could sort of, you, you could kind of try to solve like the integral equation that you would get by looking at like what happens when you apply the, the, the Perron Frobenius operator. But um, yeah, that's a hard problem. This is like, um, like you're, you're fixing one Lambda for a while and then running a bunch of numerical simulation with that Lambda fixed. And then so you move we're on fixing, the so we're not fixing lambda. We're we're taking like we're still pulling lambdas from from some kind of a a density uh, a density on that interval zero one. So I think that these were generated from like taking lambdas from a uniform distribution of one to four, right? So each time I get a newly generated lambda according to that distribution, and then apply use that, and then use the logistic map with that parameter value and hit x with it, and then just kind of keep track. As you're going, and do this, do this many, many times. You guys kind of, uh, do you all expect the, the same sort of behavior? If um, I don't know, if you, if you take like dis different distributions of your lambda, like instead of uniform, like some Gaussian mixture concentrated on. A yeah, I believe, like I believe, um, because a lot of the results out there for this like heresy irreducible stuff requires. Um, um, that your distribution of lambdas be absolutely continuous. Um, so I believe in those cases, as long as your probability function is absolutely continuous, um, that you should still see these results. Um, it would be a different question if, if you had some kind of a, like um, discrete or like a, like a delta distribution for lambdas, right? So let's say for instance, lambda took value three with probability one half and it takes value four with probability one half, right? That would be a slightly different situation. Anybody have any other questions? So if not, let's, let's maybe go ahead and thank you really once more. All right. Thanks so much, Zach, for, for, for inviting me and having me. Um, this has been fun. Yeah, this is, this is wonderful. Here, one sec, let me I'll stop the recording here. Uh, there we go.